Good morning, everybody. All right. So we are. How five boards changed the world, and we did. That's my version. We're going to have a, a revisionist history of what we were doing way back then. And um, one of the things we did do is, I think, bring models from a very rickety state in the sort of uh, late 70s, early 80s to where they are now, you know, Earth system models, which is quite realistic and pretty useful. All right, so, yeah, great. So a quick flashback. Give me time walk back to July 20th, 1994. Some indecipherable time, Zulu. And uh, some of you were sitting up in um, Thompson, in the hangar, I think. And the other, the rest of you are sitting down the snow just as large. And you're hearing your captive audiences of me and Forrest were ranting about what we're going to do the next day. And this is what we plan to do. <laughs> I don't think anybody in NASA has ever done anything like this since. 16 missions in one day with uh, God knows how many aircraft. And, um, Okay. Fabulous. Can I move? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm all good. And um, when, when you look at this, this busy little chart here, it, it starts off at the top. It's got the satellite overpasses, and then uh, for the northern site, then the southern, the, uh, southern site. And there has all the aircraft stacked up. Uh, and by altitude, you're starting out with the ER-2 and just crank your way all the way down through a helicopter and then three flux aircraft grobbling around at the bottom. So there you go. So uh, this was the first time I think we'd had the ER-2 shop to the site. And uh, he hadn't been briefed about what was going to be going on below him. And sort of he comes in, he checks in, I'm rolling on my first flight line. And he thought it was going to be him, you know, solo glory like this, showing up over the Boreas site. And you could hear this just, you know, 10 other aircraft all yelling at each other and yelling at Boreas Ops. And I just heard this puzzled voice from, you know, 65,000 feet saying, what is going on down there? <laughs> and uh, it, 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 was, it was pretty busy. And if you look carefully, my eyes aren't good enough now, but there is a spot overpass. There was one moment where all the aircraft, they're all stacked up and they're on the grounds taking their, their, their measurements and we yelled out over the radio, smile, and that was it. <laughs> so the whole of the Boreas team is on candid camera, captured in one image, all the way up from the stratosphere down to the surface. It was, it was quite the thing. And here's all the surface teams. Each little box is somebody doing something usually under horrific conditions, you know, uh, fighting bugs and beavers and things like that. Um, this is good. This was uh, the briefing sheet for the end of uh, that evening. And it says, just to keep people on track and on focus, item four, possible immense barbecue beer bash at Waskasu on the 28th. So we, we, we had to do something to string people along. I keep them keep them interested. And then just to show, you know, that we weren't sort of intimidated by anything, here's all the aircraft that we had our who did the missions on the twenty first on the southern site. And on the twenty second, we drove them all up, the ones that had to be moved up to the northern site during the day. And on the twenty uh, third they flew off almost the same number of missions over the northern site because that nice high pressure that had been over the southern site had drifted over the northern site and we just got there ahead of it and snapped it twice. So it was, it was good. So, um, oh yeah, there we go, there's missions for the 23rd. All right, so, you know, what do we know and when did we know it? Who got this started? And some of the blame goes to Hansen. And here's a picture of him giving testimony in 1988, but actually the work had been done in the late 70s. 
that had, you know, showed the, the, the threat of global warming. And um, he was talking about, you know, what was likely to happen. These results actually turned out to be remarkably robust over a period of 40 years. But it had been done with very, very primitive um, models. I mean, uh, four by five degrees was at the, the best resolution we had, 11 degrees in the ver vertical. And so th they were rickety tools. And over the continents, they were terrible. And um, an assessment was made in 1983, uh, or the book was 83, but the assessment was made in 82 that the land surface parameterization was rather unrealistic. We had fixed fields of albedo, surface roughness, no idea how to do evapotranspiration, no accounting for vegetation. But the question was, does anybody care? Should we, should we even try and do bother to do better in GCMs? And there's the old bucket model. I'm going to skip over these in the first generation LSPs, um, which is basically like a block of felt with uh, soaking up water from the bottom and slowly evaporating from the top. Uh, with a bit of roughness on it, so it's corrugated felt. And, uh, and the right shade of grey, that, that was about it. So Shulkin and Mintz determined to see if any of this was important. And they're very famous, you know, I, I show this a lot, but the very famous cases that they did uh, where they made the continents all wet in one case and all dry in another <coughs> case. And when you look at precipitation, that you get from that. Um, basically, when you have a dry soil case where the, con the continents like parking lots, uh, you, you turn the continental interiors into deserts. There's no vertical rainfall recycling. And when the uh, continents are wet all the time, somehow you, you know, move all the water around so you have a completely saturated continents all the time, it's raining all the time. Basically, it's like Ireland, you know, except everywhere. Uh, that's right pretty soggy. So neither was right. Um, so uh, temperature, of course, follows along with that. Wet soil case is damp and muggy. Uh, dry soil case is like Sahara, pretty much everywhere. So, hey, easy demonstration that we had to be able to do better. Uh, so Isil Skip was born. Fantastic. 1984, the first meeting of Isil Skip, just a really sort of a uh, very loose gaggle of people. Uh, Bob Dickinson was there, he invited me along. And it was decided, you know, we'll collect the data to improve LSPs, and then we'll see if we can use satellites to initialize and validate these parameterizations on regional and global scales. So, okay, why not? Uh, we didn't know any better. Uh, so in 1985-86, NASA Biospheric Sciences stepped up the plate. And 87, we hit the field near Manhattan, Kansas. Here we go. And we made a little logo. And uh, I still have a coffee mug. <laughs> there you go. And there is uh, Manhattan, Kansas, as snapped, I think, a few weeks ago by um, Fred Humrich on his way back from a conference. And he just looked out his plate, you know, jetliner window. And there was the Manhattan, Kansas site recovering slowly from the abuse we gave it all <laughs> back, back then. And um, so a couple of things happened. Uh, in 1985-86, we had this little, little uh, five science plan, which is pretty slim, refined, bespoke publication uh, with a hand drawn. Thank you very much, because we couldn't afford much in those days. So I drew the logo. Um, little logo there, sort of some concept of how this would look. But in, uh, from Christmas 86 through the beginning of 87, when we got the teams together, we wrote the yellow book, which is the experiment plan. And, and that process, which I think was kind of really important of hammering out what we were going to do, how we're going to do it, how we're going to organize ourselves, how we're going to check if we were off track, how the scientists would be able to correct the gross errors being committed by management, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, Paul Jarvis was really good at that. He would stand up at meetings in Boris, in Boris uh, Ops, you know, 50 people say, Piers, that's total bullshit. And, uh, oh, okay, good. So, 
<laughs> but um, basically having the whole thing written down before we got there was essential. I think one of the most important things about Fife and then later Boris was the sheer variety of different people who showed up to the party, uh, different disciplines. So atmospheric boundary layer, surface fluxes, correction calibration, surface radiances, soil moisture, and then integrative sciences. I mean, this was a, a bunch of people who didn't even share the same units. They couldn't even talk to each other for the first few months. I remember you know, seeing whiteboards covered with derivations and textbooks, uh, lookups and stuff like that, and references, just to go from moles per square meter per second to something else, uh, you know, that uh, people could watch per meter or something. So people worked hard to just be able to speak everyone else's language. And off we went. Uh, we did four field campaigns in 87, and then another one in 89. Um, lots of coordinated measurement plans with on-the-fly on the uh, improvisations. Five satellites, 10 aircraft, 150 people. A lot of fun. It's great. Oh, yeah, five information system. So uh, we had a staff uh, base, basically uh, um, based in the biospheric sciences branch who organized all the data. And I think this was revolutionary. It says here it was revolutionary idea and managed by a revolutionary. <laughs> that, was Don, that was Don Strebel. Uh, yeah, who, who would, who, yeah, he would revolt occasionally. Um, but putting, this, putting the data set together, I think, was, was a key part of the success so that everyone can actually access each other's stuff. So here we went. And there's a picture of the twin otter doing his stuff. Whoop. Back one. Um, 589, but it's kind of pretty typical of some <coughs> of the things we did in 587. Two flux aircraft at a very low level, a helicopter at 1,000 feet, uh, C-130 doing some flight lines above that, and then under flying a satellite. Snap, snap. Flux patterns over a 15 kilometer area where you could see some coherence between CO2 flux, water flux, and temperature. Same thing when you're comparing airborne eddy correlation, which are the big crosses against surface flux stations. So this business of, of going from leaf measurements to, to um, surface flux measurements from an eddy correlation station up to airborne cor cor eddy correlation for the whole site, it, it held together remarkably well. I mean, we, 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 uh, we tested the snot out of this and it worked great. It really worked great. Um, these are various stripes, data stripes, taken from north to south. Uh, as a digital elevation model, simple ratio vegetation index, um, microwave, soil, surface soil moisture, and then surface uh, airborne eddy correlation. Another example of more coordinated stuff, and so on and so forth. And all of that, of course, went into the hopper, and you can't read it from here, but there's all these examples of different ways the data was used and in coordinated models and all the rest of it. So some very nice special issues came out of that. I remember we had a, um, a, a seminar here, and uh, somebody was giving a talk, and this guy comes in with a little hand truck at the back of the conference. And he says, oh, I've got the special issues here. So we had to stop the proceedings so that everyone could get their special issue and have a five minute gloat. You know, could stroke the, paper, the parchment and, and all the rest of it. All right, on to Boris. Uh, gusted up the logo a bit. We thought that this part of Canada and North America in general would be the hotspot for warming and, ch and change. Boris was more ambitious. It had carbon fluxes in there, um, as well as the uh, water fluxes, and long-term feedbacks. OK. And it was a lot harder. But we thought we were up for it, because uh, coming out of Fife, we'd kind of got our techniques brushed up, and we were thought we were tough. <coughs> so uh, Canadians came in as full-on partners, which was fantastic, because uh, without it, we couldn't have done, done them. And it was really shared the whole burden of the of the experiment. Uh, the two big study areas, field campaigns, I've forgotten about 93, 
So there's the preparatory for campaign in 93, then all the ones in 94, and then 96. Uh, harsh climate, and nobody told me about the bugs before it got started out, but unbelievable. I mean, uh, the animals that would take chunks out of you. No, no mercy at all. A lot of people. Um, I think 84, 84 teams altogether, about 300 people cycled through Boreas. Tested Boreas positive at the end of it. We made some very nice figures. Because uh, we thought by this time we sort of thought we were new, we, what we were doing. So uh, made some beautiful figures of how we were going from small scales to larger scales. But basically the same, same ideas that we had tested in Fife um, stood up remarkably well. Finding the sites was hard. Uh, Forrest had the maps and the images and all the rest of it. Andy Black was the local scout, you know, Canadian with the, the knowledge. And basically, uh, uh, he threw up so much uh, in these little plane flights that I always figured out that he was throwing up more than he'd actually eaten. <laughs> how, how, how could this be? You know. But we flew all the way around northern and southern Canada looking for sites. And, um, you know, the hard part, to be honest, is really prosaic, was finding in the south the sites that were close to power lines so we could get power drops. I mean, was, that, that, that took just a lo the longest time, but it was worth it. And here's these, some of these sites. That's the Fen site, which apparently now you can walk on. It's like a golf course, but that was, uh, if you stepped off the plank to left or right in those days, you would sink. I think that's the Northern Study Area. Uh, I think it's Steve Woff's site. Steve Watts' grad student on the left. Of course. Yeah. Is that right? Right at Old Aspen. Right is Old Aspen. Yeah, that, that's right. It's a joke. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, that's Black Spruce. Sorry. Black Spruce. Yeah. Yeah. That's Old Joe Berry. Yeah. <laughs> There's the old, old Joe Berry. Old Joe Berry Spruce. Yeah. Spot that investigator. Yeah. Uh, helicopter. And Willie is here today. Yes. yes. Present and correct. And um, he lived in a, Willie lived in a swamp in the, in the southern area. And uh, I go in there and just remarkable relief from the bugs. Amazing. It was like an oasis. How, how do you do this, Willie? And, and what is that smell of kerosene? That's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> just basically, his helicopter was sitting in the middle of like a one kilometer lake of kerosene. <laughs> Let's keep the bugs down. Uh, and that picture there is, uh, on the right of the helicopter is during the Grand Migration uh, on the 22nd of July, 94, when all the aircraft moved from the south to the north. So I snuck up on Willie from behind and took that shot of him. And it was like a four and a half hour transit. Yes. The long, long slog, a lot of peddling, yeah. <laughs> um, minus 40. In the middle of winter, you know, Napoleon was a sissy, really, com compared to us. You said it was a great way to take care of nose hair, right? Inhale and blow your nose. It was unbelievable. <laughs> I, I didn't think you could get that cold. I would be like, a, I'd be paralyzed until I got my freezer suit. Um, here's uh, the twin otter mowing the lawn, basically, looking out here. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, that thing on the, the left sticking out the nose of the twin otter is to basically intimidate mosquitoes. <laughs> so mine's bigger than yours. <laughs> yeah, twin otter in winter. Um, ER2, DC8, C130, and the uh, University of Wyoming King Air with its boom out there. Eyeball, my personal favorite. And we saw that. Um, Alan Betts ranting to the faithful. So. They didn't listen. No. <laughs> Was this, yeah. Um, we had the science seminars. I don't know if you remember that quite often. And that, that, that was kind of fun. Uh, well, the alternative was going to do karaoke in Waska Sioux. So, yeah, this was fun. <laughs> Uh, Boris Ops. 
there's Carla on the right, and me on the left. And we, we, made our, we made our chairs look very official. Mission manager and study area manager. And when we sat there, we took, you know, it was like being the president. So what do we get out of it? Lots of really integrated large data sets that, that all kind of cut into each other. And thanks to Fizz Boris and uh, Arnold Dack, that stuff is still out there. Um, tons of publications. Uh, I think I want to see hopefully updated versions of these diagrams and this one, but just just amazing uh, amount of publications came out of it. Um, but per dollar spent, it was quite quite remarkable. And one of the things that got solved, um, which I think was particularly powerful, and I was just talking about this in the Nordberg. Um, event the other day was that we effectively proved to ourselves that you could take a very large pixel from orbit of a satellite of, of greenness and calculate the photosynthesis from that. And that estimate of photosynthesis turned out to be remarkably invariant of the way the vegetation was arranged on the ground. It could be spotty, it could be even, it could be all hunched up in one corner of the pixel box, but it didn't matter. What the satellite saw in greenness in terms of, and, and, and the retrieval of photosynthesis and conductance that came out of that was uh, remarkably robust. And that allowed you to do things like calculate, um, you know, with coarse resolution GCMs, when they're not coarse anymore, calculate things like, uh, you know, um, carbon dioxide fluxes, transpiration, uh, net primary production and all those kinds of things. Not possible without that result that really came from Fife and Boris. So one of them. All right. So I'm winding up here, you can tell. Um, I think that the field experiments arrived just in time for our system science. Uh, they accelerated the collaboration between previously isolated scientific communities. It wouldn't have happened, I don't think, without without the um, forcing function of the field experiments. So we've got real interdisciplinary science as opposed to just a cliche. You know, people talked about in the academy. This was, this was real, uh, the real thing. New models, pathfinder for a lot of EOS work, and a new generation of students who I think had a blast, you know, taking part in the experiments. And, you know, something to talk about as we all got older. Um, war stories and so forth. What was achieved? Uh, input for EOS in the nick of time. Um, people were st well, questioning whether MODIS was really going to be useful. Uh, you know, and I think this helped. I really do. We also came up with the justification for the MODIS channels at uh, 250 meters for cloud screening. That came out of five. Um, so that was, that was really significant. Uh, talk about the data sets, realistic models, you know, basically scaling up to the globe, something that hadn't been done before, and, uh, you know, more credible third generation models. And I think we'll basically knock 10 to 15 years off what it would have taken to do without the field experiments. I think we got a 10 to 15 year jump on the whole science. So it, it was worth it, in my view. Um, kept me busy and excited for quite a while. So, and I, I wouldn't have met all of you if it hadn't been for that. So thanks, it's great to see you all, by the way. I mean, you guys are all living clean lives or something. You're, you look remarkably well. Good stuff, thanks.